Hey folks, um, I'm Greg Anderson from Arctic Startup. It's a blog that should be familiar to all of you out here, hopefully. And um, yeah, I'm joined here by Gil Dimner from uh, DFJ Esprit. Thanks, thanks for having me. I, I read your blog every day, and I, you didn't pay me to say that. That's right. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, so I guess we're talking about um, busting myths like uh, in early stage funding here. So I, I think a good way to start off is maybe to start talking about like um, what, what companies you've recently invested in and uh, yeah, what, what, what's interesting to you right now? So um, as a firm, uh, we're a 100 million uh, euro VC firm. We invest across Europe and across stages from early stage to late stage. Um, so about uh, two, two thirds of the money we invest is actually in late stage companies. Um, so far, I've done two early stage investments in the, in the, in the year that I've been at the firm. Um, one of them is a, is a German company called Roadcode, uh, which is doing enterprise source code control. Uh, so we were the first money in uh, and uh, together with a German VC firm. Um, and uh, we, we also invested in, a, uh, in an Austrian company called Crate, uh, which does an open source database. And they, they just won uh, TechCrunch Europe. So we're, we're very, very thrilled. OK, interesting. Um, so you're seeing lots of early stage deals, basically, and coming in contact with um, lots of entrepreneurs that uh, I guess are kind of figuring out the ropes as they go along, you know? So um, I guess uh, what's, well, let's just talk generally. Like, what, what are some of the, the kind of the, the myths or perceptions you think entrepreneurs have of VCs? Well, I think the, the, the first thing I've, I've noticed, and, and obviously there's all kinds of VCs and there's all kinds of entrepreneurs. So there's entrepreneurs that have been around the block three or four times. Um, but the majority of companies that we see are, are first-time founders, uh, and particularly at the A round stage, um, it's usually the first time that a founder is really engaging with, with, with the venture community. Um, and one of the things that we, we notice, and I think, I think we all need to be sensitive to, is there, there, is, there tends to be a great experiential and informational disparity between what the founder knows and, and thinks and what the VCs know and think, right? For the founder, it's the first time that a VC is taking them seriously and likely to invest in them. For the VC, it might be the 100th time they've signed a term sheet or the 50th time they signed a term sheet. And it's probably the, you know, I've only been doing this for 10 years. I've probably seen more than 1,000 companies a year. So you can imagine how many interactions we've had with founders. Um, and so that informational disparity, I think, works sometimes against the entrepreneur. And I think VCs need to be, you know, I've, I've written, uh, you know, a bunch of blog posts about this where I, I think VCs need to educate before they negotiate, right? I think VCs need to play a role in bringing the founders up to speed and, and, and helping them understand the landscape that they're operating in. Well, well why is that, though? Like, if the, the entrepreneur doesn't really realize what a 4x liquidation preference is and uh, you guys can get that into the term sheet, like, isn't that kind of a win for you? Or uh, why, why, would, why do you feel like you need to get entrepreneurs up to speed then? Well, first of all, if anyone's offering you a 4x liquidation preference, don't take it. Yeah. Um, I think um, there's, you know, and you see this a lot in, in, in Europe, I think, more than the States, um, where there are early stage investors that, that sometimes take advantage of founders that they, that they meet, someone who has a very interesting, a very interesting technology, very interesting business, um, but doesn't really know how the game is played and doesn't necessarily have the experience to see what the next step needs to look like. So for example, I've met companies in, uh, in Germany and in Scotland and in other places um, that have raised, you know, well under a million euros and have already given up 60 or 70 percent of the company to the angel investors, right? So we're not even talking about liquidation preference. We're just talking about straight equity. Um, these guys have already given up control of their, of their venture to very early stage investors at a very low valuation. And then when, when, the, when the, the larger VCs come in and take a serious interest, it becomes very difficult for us because we need to unwind that very unhealthy cap table, get more equity for the entrepreneur, you know, piss off those angel investors. It, it becomes very, very difficult, right? Um, and, and I think that's something that, you know, that's an example of, of helping people. Like I, I have, in the past month alone, I've had several conversations with early stage companies that are, that are coming to me for advice on their angel rounds. And I'm telling them, demand a higher valuation because if you if you take money at that low level you're giving up so much of your company that you won't be able to it'll be very difficult for you to get the next round done so it's also somewhat in your your best interest to to not necessarily um, poison the well too much so like another investor can come on later and uh, like continue the growth of the company then of course yeah I, I think that's you know this is this is uh, it, it's a little bit of a, of, of a high level 
thing to say, but, but I think um, we, we all need to remember that we're all in this together, right? As an ecosystem, as VCs and entrepreneurs, the goal here is to build businesses, to build communities, to build ecosystems. And if a company fails because it had a, a messed up cap table, or if a company fails because you know, they picked the wrong investors, right? Then everybody loses out. The employees that would have been hired by that company don't get jobs. The founder that would have had a nice exit and gone on to do another company doesn't get to do that. The VCs that would have made a nice exit, raised more money from LPs and invested in more companies in this ecosystem or that ecosystem, that doesn't happen, right? So I think we all need to stick together and play the long game, right? And I think one of the, the things that I love about venture capital is this is a long game and it's a people business, right? So even though my job, for example, is to say no to entrepreneurs 99% of the time, uh, the real question is, how do you say no? Will, will they come back? So we're, I think we always need to think about investing in people. Uh, same thing for, for, for other VCs and for, for entrepreneurs that deal with, deal with VCs, right? You, you, you may not, that VC may not say yes to you, um, but build the relationship and they'll be, they'll be there later. Yeah, that makes sense, yeah. Um, I think for, for entrepreneurs to understand like, um, how to, to well, to, to kind of bust these myths here, I think it also makes sense to understand like what a VC is looking for. Um, I remember a couple of years ago when I first started at Arctic Startup, I had a, a meeting with uh, Tatiana from the EIF and uh, just talking about how she puts money into these um, VC firms and just kind of the whole VC money groveling, like, can we please get some money, uh, you know, on the, on the principal side there. So like, what, what are your needs as a, as a VC firm? Like, what are, you, what are you looking for to show to your principals? Well, I think every firm is different. And I, 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 that's something that, that a lot of entrepreneurs, I think, don't understand. Or, or you know, and it, it might be a function of the startup culture that we're creating, right? We all come to these events, or we all read the same TechCrunch articles or Arctic Startup articles. And there's, there's, a, there's a tendency to think that, OK, if it was true for, for Zendesk or if it was true for Uber, it's going to be true for my company. And, and it's not true. Every company is different. Um, and part of the difficulty of this is the, of, of building companies and investing in companies is that every case is unique and if you're really innovating, your business is going to be totally new. Uh, like Mimoto or Yola, these are totally new companies um, that require new thinking, new strategies, etc. And the, the role of the entrepreneur is to find the VC that really understands that, that understands the uniqueness of their business. And the role of the VC is to figure out that, okay, this company that I'm investing in now is different than other companies and, and what do they need and what's, what are the right milestones and strategies. Um, now, having said that, from the VC side, there are different kinds of VCs with different objectives. And, and one of the things that um, I've noticed entrepreneurs doing, I think, is, is a lot of people are just going about fundraising completely backwards, right? You, you start with a VC, and then you say, okay, well, I, need, I, I, need to, I, I want to do a bunch of things in my company, so I need money to do that. So I'm going to talk to some VCs, right? And you end up driving the process by who the VCs are and what they want, as opposed to what does your company need and who are the right partners for me to go find who can give me, that, give me the resources to execute on what I think the business needs as the entrepreneur. So, so how do you do that as a structured approach? Like say, hey, I'm looking for funding now. Like I, I, I obviously think I'm going to go for uh, DFJ or something like that. It's a brand that I recognize. But what's, what's the better way to build that up then? Um, well, that, that's probably a, a, a six-hour workshop that, that I'd yeah. be happy to run with you. But I, I think it, it, to, to give the short version of that, I actually think it starts with the entrepreneur and his team or her team sitting together in a closed room with no investors anywhere in sight saying, OK, what do we want to achieve as a business? And how much money and time do we need to get to a position where we think that we can raise the next round or get to the next milestone, right? So as a business, you only have two choices. You can either get to break even, or you can get to a position where someone else will fund you. Those are the only choice, or you die. Those are the three choices you have, right? Yeah. So if you, if you think you can get to break even, great. And if you think you can get to a place where someone will fund you, great. And then the, the next thing you do is you actually go, and I think if you're, if you're raising an A round, my advice would be go talk to the B round guys and go validate with them you know, to a B round guy. Say, look, I know that you will not invest in me because I'm an A round company. But if I came to you in 18 months and I showed you this, would you be interested? Right? Yeah. And I think that's a super useful conversation to have at the A-Round level, because then you know what you're building for in terms of the milestones. And then you've defined the A-Round properly. And many times, I've gone through this process with companies, and they've come back and said, you know what? We thought we were going to raise you know, you know, 1.5, and we actually need 1.8, because there's just no way we can get to the milestone on 1.5. We need more. Mm -hmm. right? And then you know what you're looking for. And then you, if you have VC funds that can only invest a million, then you know you shouldn't talk to them because you actually need almost two to get anywhere. Or maybe you need two funds that can each invest a million. But once you've defined for yourself what your goals are and what resources you need to get there, then you can narrow down VCs by, is this even relevant for them? But it, it should start with your company and not with what you think VCs want to hear. OK, that makes sense. 
Um, <clears throat> so um, working towards those milestones, like, uh, well, one, one thing I hear from the entrepreneurs that I talk to is like, oh yeah, well, like once, once, after getting seed funding, like my whole job is just raising funding, like coming from a CEO or something like that. It, like, it, is this actually a time consuming process? Is this something that like um, these CEOs should be spending like 90% of their days on or is, should their focus still be like running the company? Like how, how, how much attention should they be it's, putting on this? It's a great question. Um, and and I'm, I'm afraid I don't have a great answer for you. I, I, I think, first of all, I think VCs are generally not aware of how difficult fundraising is for the entrepreneurs and how much resource and energy gets spent on it. Um, because we're the beneficiaries of that effort. We get to see the nice slide decks and the data and all that stuff and we can ask for charts and people have to go make the charts for us. So as a VC, I try to be very sensitive to people's time. If I, if I know I'm not going to invest in a company, I just don't take the meeting. Um, I try not to ask people to do work to show me more data unless there's a serious chance that we're going to invest and we actually need that data to make a decision. Mm. Um, but more broadly speaking, I think entrepreneurs should be limiting the amount of time they spend fundraising and, and focus on execution as much as they can. Um, depending again on the capital needs of the business. If you're in a business where you desperately need 10 million euros to do anything because you're doing consumer marketing and it only works at scale, then maybe you need to raise that first. But if you're building a tech product, if you're building developer tooling like the road code guys, the road code guys managed to get to 100,000 downloads and it's pretty significant ARR with major customers without a dollar of angel money from anyone, right? Mm -hmm. Because they just, they were really doing lean startup. I mean, the proper, not lean fundraising, they were actually building the company lean. And the VCs came and showed up and said, hey, we want to help you. It's a much better dynamic than, than knocking on a VC's door all day. Yeah. So, like, the, there's been a lot of tools popping up uh, recently to help uh, in entrepreneurs like reach out to uh, investors such as like AngelList or um, any number of these platforms. So do you, do you spend a lot of time on AngelList personally? Like is this a, a way, a good way for entrepreneurs to reach out to investors like yourself or how, what, what is the perfect way for you to get pitched I guess? Yeah, it's, uh, Again, uh, um, I think it's a great question. Um, so I would say the following, I, I would say yes, I spent, as a VC I spent time on AngelList, I spent time on GitHub, I spent time on LeanStack, I spent time on, which is now called StackShare, I spent time on, on Product Hunt, I spent time on all of these platforms where I might be able to find interesting companies before other people have found them. Yeah. Um, one, that, I think that's, that's driving two fundamental changes in the venture landscape. One is, I think there's really no such thing as, as proprietary deal flow. It happens sometimes, you know, repeat entrepreneurs that just take their deal to the VC that they know and trust and no one else gets to see that company, right? Yeah. But the vast majority of companies that get, are getting started are, are public somehow and available for angels and VCs to find and help um, and it's our job to find them. Um, I don't think VCs can afford to sit back and hope that entrepreneurs come to them. We need to be proactive about searching out the interesting companies. And lots of VCs are investing in big data and other, other tools to help them do that more effectively. Um, scout programs and so on. Um, the second uh, I, change that this is driving is that information, and this is something that AngelList played a critical role in, in helping make happen, information about how to negotiate the venture process um, is much more widely available. So entrepreneurs are, if, if, if they just you know, read and, and talk to people and network, um, they have the ammunition that they need to uh, defend themselves against bad VC behavior. And I think the implication of that is that the shark VC is an extinct species or is a species headed for extinction. And the same is true for the shark angel, right? So I think that's great news for entrepreneurs. Great, great. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> When uh, talking about the sharks like uh, becoming extinct, there like uh, we were also talking backstage about um, um, about like the clueless entrepreneur too, or like there's someone that just looks as the VC as like a checkbook as well. And uh, so I guess that's another myth to kind of be breaking down here. Like you guys are working hands on with uh, <laughs> every part of the process. Yeah, I, I think VCs, VCs do work hand, hands on with their companies. I, I, I try to work hard for them. Um, and every VC I know tries in their own way to work hard. Different VCs have different backgrounds and different ability to add value. Um, I do think it's, it's important to recognize that the primary function of, of a VC in, in the life cycle of a startup is to help define the milestones from a fundraising perspective and to help chaperone and shepherd the company to help get to those milestones and, and to help the CEO manage the process of adjusting the milestones if necessary, right? I think um, we, we often talk about pivot, um, and it's one thing to pivot while you're fundraising. It's another thing to pivot if you've already raised 5 million euros 
and suddenly you realize that's not working because the market has changed, yeah. and now we're running out of money, and the forecast, we thought we were gonna do five million in revenue this year, we're actually gonna do zero, and now we need some more money because I've already hired 30 people. That's when the conversations with VCs become really, really critical, um, and, and that's when experience matters. Okay, okay. Now, like, when you're, what, what would you suggest, like, uh, is, is really important for, like, entrepreneurs when they're negotiating these term sheets and, like, getting in touch with you, like, um, is, do you, is, this, uh, um, is it common that, like, an entrepreneur, or that you'll just give a term sheet to an entrepreneur and they'll just sign it right away, or, or are they always bringing, like, a, a, uh, a lawyer in, or uh, what, what have you seen out there? Uh, well, my term sheets are wonderful, so they always get signed immediately, yeah. but... Um, <laughs> You know, I think every entrepreneur should bring a lawyer with them, um, and we often recommend lawyers. Um, and and uh, in fact, every deal I've done, I've recommended a lawyer. Um, the the uh, I, I think I think the myth on, on on term sheets is really that you know you should stop when you get a term sheet, uh, and I think you should actually keep going when you have multiple VCs interested. From a entrepreneur's pers pers perspective, you want to be operating in a, in a competitive environment. You want multiple VCs to be competing for the deal. That's when you know you have a really hot deal, not just one fool who thinks this is a good company and then you're captive because he's the only person you've convinced, right? Um, the best companies usually have multiple VCs competing for them. That helps ensure that the terms are fair. It helps ensure that the price is right. Um, and it pretty much prevents the VCs from doing anything, you know, unhelpful because they will lose the deal as a result. Um, th that's, you know, I think if, there, if there's a central myth on fundraising, it's probably this, that entrepreneurs think that the fundraising is about the VCs. It's actually about them. Um, entrepreneurs should be deciding how many VCs they want, which VCs they want, what terms are acceptable and unacceptable, you know, what the round ought to be. Um, you know, I, I had a conversation with an entrepreneur just last week. He said, you know, I've got a term sheet on the table. Um, and and he, this is in another ecosystem, so, so it's not a deal that I would do, but, but the guy said, I've got a term, term sheet on the table, and it's from the wrong VC for the wrong amount of money, uh, and I need more money. And I said to him, well, why don't you just tell him? Just tell him, you know, I'm raising five million, not three million, and so either you put in the five, or you help me find another VC who'll put in the rest, or, I'm, or you keep looking, because otherwise you've raised the wrong amount of money, and, and the company, you, you know, you've told me you need five and you're going to raise three. So, so don't be surprised when you run out of money, right? And, and, and entrepreneurs need to be uh, aggressive custodians of their companies and saying, you know what, if I need that money, that's what I'm going to raise and, and not compromise. Okay, I think we're just running out of time right now and that's a great quote to end on. So um, thanks again, Gil, for taking the time here. Thank you.